I said, welcome to Circular Coffee and Conversation with myself, Erica and Sophie. Uh, we've been running this for about seven months now, I think since November last year with a whole host of different types of circular economy inspired and related uh, businesses, organizations, individuals and campaigns on different themes. This year we started focusing on almost different topics. So we've had uh, food, drinks and packaging, although this might look a bit. And now we've just actually, this will be the last one of our fashion and textiles um, theme before moving on to rest and regeneration. Which actually will probably take a little bit of a rest and a break over summer and encourage others to do the same after our, our session on that. But today we're delighted to be joined uh, by Vivek from Perpetual Technologies and a number of other uh, businesses and organisations I understand as well. Um, Sophie will be chatting to him for about 15 minutes. Uh, please log your questions or responses or use the chat to share your links as well um, as we go along and then we'll be able to pick up some questions at the end. So it should all be just half an hour as well. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Sophie. Thank you, Erika. Hope you all have your warm cup of tea or coffee, whatever you can see at the time of the morning. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Mark was still waiting to see the beer kit that you had one day, so one day you're going to have to bring that to us. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, welcome again, everyone. So we've got Vivek today, and I think, you know, we got really excited when uh, Vivek said he could come and join us because he was actually part of the first face-to-face -face events that we also did in Reading. And he's very local to us as well in Twyford and, you know, that we're always really keen to sort of bring to life some of the great things that local businesses are doing here as well. So Vivek, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and we always start our conversation by asking our guests to bring a circular conversation starter. So it's basically a physical object um, that inspires you around the circular economy. So we were wondering, what did you bring us with today? Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. So I think I'll cheat a little bit and ask if I can bring two things. And the things oh, I've right. brought, the things I brought are really, it's your fault that I've done this because you told me that this was a very relaxed, very chilled environment and I should be free to be relaxed. So I am being relaxed and I brought two things. And these are the two things I brought. And as we go through the discussion today, we can understand why. I figured it's 11 o'clock in the morning, you can have your coffee and I'll have my, uh, my enjoyment as well. Oh, I love it. You know what's from here? It looks very interesting. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, we'll go from there. You teased our interest. Okay, so you're not going to tell us much more about that. So let's straight I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put these down for now. I'll, I'll put them on the side and then we'll come back to that. I like that. Right, so Vivek, I think something that, you know, we always find really inspiring when talking to you is the fact that actually you're very much an entrepreneur in the sustainability world. This business is not your first one. And we were wondering, you know, if you can start almost by the beginning, telling us how the idea of virtual technologies came and, and the technology that you got behind, basically, please. Yeah, um, so the idea and concept really started pretty much in the late 1990s. Um, I came up with a theme that in my head, which I kind of considered it and called it Minds Above Ground. <clears throat> and Minds Above Ground was a concept where um, it was trying to encourage people not to use the word waste. And rather to think of something, and also not to use the word used, because that gave a connotation to people that I've taken this thing, I've used it, and I now know want it, so I can discard it. And it was building up that idea that eventually led me to look at recycling as really taking a product that somebody didn't want or had got the benefit from it once, but now somebody else could get the benefit from it again. And, and that spun off a lot of investments and technology investments into the recycling sector. And I do recycling because Again, the definition for me of recycling is taking a product that somebody has made use of once and then converting it back into a product of equal or higher value to the conventional material. So again, in the late 1990s or early 2000s, I don't think the word downcycling was there as much, but today one would call it downcycling. So for me, recycling is not downcycling. It's not waste management. It's truly taking a product developing technology and the ability to reverse engineer that product back into virgin quality material. 
and then reuse it and recycle it again. And that, that's, that was kind of the theme which we spun off a number of technologies, battery recycling, lithium ion battery recycling, et cetera, et cetera, metal recycling, um, and then also PET polyester recycling. There you go. So that is the journey. Kira. I love like the semantic that you've got around that because clearly, you know, it does change a lot around our mindsets around that. Yeah, changing mindsets is a is a really important thing. Um, you know, again, mid eighties, late nineties, two thousands is all about corporate development, making money, bigger things, um, and to actually get people to develop fundamental technology to recycle something you had to have that mindset because it was always waste management, waste management. You can take the waste and make it less wasteful or less harmful, but there was never that mindset of taking it and creating a valuable product. And, and that, that once you got that mindset into the engineers and the developers, then you started to really make breakthrough developments. Oh, there's so many questions I could ask you. <laughs> You know, first, <laughs> you know, going back to what you showed us, you know, like, I know this is not just a little powder, white powder stuff. Go on, tell us a little bit more about how this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know. It's kind of, um, okay. So um, this, by the way, I don't you hear it. So that's a plastic bottle. So actually what excites me here, of course, now you know that it's plastic, is that this is PET plastic. And um, PET plastic actually is made, I think, again, a lot of you will know this. So I apologize if I'm repeating, but it fundamentally comes from oil and gas, right? So it's oil. You take oil and you distillate the oil and you get two chemical materials. You get a chemical material called PTA, polytyric acid, and MEG, or short name is glycol. And when you mix your PTA and MEG together, you get effectively something that's called an ester. And the way I like to think about it, ester is your base building block to make anything PET. You put your ester through a standard processing for the continuous polymerizer, it's a standard processing piece of equipment, been around for years, and you get a polyester or many chains of ester. Okay, so that's that's your base, that's what people have been doing for the last you know generations. And um, I think what but this is effectively what ester is. Okay. So this is what ester would look like. And um, and uh, yeah I'm just as excited about this as most London nightclubbers are about whatever they use. Um, so for me, this and this gives me the most exciting because what we have managed to do in Perpetual is take a plastic bottle and reverse back engineer it into this ester. This ester that we create is exactly the same quality as ester that you'd make from traditional oil and gas. And I'm pleased to say since 2018, we can make this ester also not just the same quality, but at the same price. So okay. from here, you can then make anything you want you can go back and make a bottle or you can make all the other products we'll talk about today <clears throat> it's absolutely every time you talk about it it's absolutely mind-blowing it seems too simple when you talk about it <laughs> and we're wondering why we haven't done that before i guess but that's uh, now that is fantastic right so when you talk about that it's quite interesting because you've got the bottle on the hand and that that you just use for different options that we're going to go into in a minute but I'm just wondering, you know, I'm not going to use the, the word waste, but basically it's bottles that have been used before. When you set up a business and you rely basically on that, that as your primary um, material source in that sense, how does the sourcing work? Do you really need to change the people's mindset to sort of return it to you? I'm quite curious about that aspect, if you can explore that a little bit further. For us. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, okay. Um, in fact, again, it is, it's not a mindset change of the consumer. It's more a mindset change of the corporates, in my opinion. Okay. So again, when I looked at this long time ago, um, plastic bottles today, just to let you know, are a commodity used. Used plastic bottles are a commodity price. So you can look them up on the internet and there's a value and a price for them. Okay. Today, today, that price is about 450 US dollars per ton of plastic bottles. Now per ton, just to give you an indication, is not such a huge amount. Once it's crushed, it's about a one, in, one meter by one meter by one meter cubed piece of thing. That's about, a, uh, you know, that's about 250 kilograms. So when you have four of those, it's about a ton, okay? So it's not that many bottles in a ton of, of uh, things. And so the concept and the mindset really has to be 
um, to, as a corporate, be willing to pay more for these plastic bottles because you have a technology that can convert this back into this. And eventually, we haven't gone through that, but you know, we then convert this into yarn. And then when you think about this yarn goes into a product like this, right? And you know, this T-shirt sells for 35 pounds in central London, in Oxford Street. <clears throat> the amount of yarn that goes into this and into this T-shirt is about 35 cents. So just to be clear, 35 pounds, 35 cents, okay? Then you gotta ask yourself the question, why can't I pay $480? for a ton of waste bottles or $500 for a ton of waste bottles, okay? And that's the value chain one has to understand is that the moment you start to say to people, look, I'm willing to pay $1,000 per ton of this, two things happen. The waste stops being wasteful. It starts getting collected. And then for the recyclers, the problem of collection disappears as well. So I like to draw the analogy here with Aluminium cans, you know, aluminium cans back in the 70s and 80s used to be everywhere, 60s. They were a blight, they were a problem. People complained about it, they whinged about it. Today, you don't see aluminium cans because they're too valuable to throw away. Why? Because there's a technology to recycle aluminium and 90% or 88% or whatever it is of aluminium is no longer virgin aluminium, it's recycled. So there is no reason why you shouldn't do that to plastic. There is absolutely no reason. This stuff is so easy to recycle once you have a technology and it's very cost effective. You can make the same cost, the same quality. So there is no reason why we shouldn't push the value of plastic bottles up. It doesn't make much difference on this, you know, 30 cents, whether you pay 30 cents or 37 or 38 cents, it makes no difference on the end product here. And that will sort your supply chain out. So, a good example, our plant right now is in India. Sorry, I'm taking too long to answer this. Our plant is in India. You know, we, we recycle about three and a half million plastic bottles a day, every day. Uh, by, by end of next year, we'll be doing about 25 to 30 million bottles a day, every day. And we collect that from, you know, within about 250 kilometers of our plant. It's not difficult. It's readily accessible because you're willing to pay $450 per ton for the bottles. That's a lot of money. <clears throat> Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I love, as you say, like the, the change of mindset for the corporate. And actually by pushing that sort of value, you put it across the entire value chain of the circular economy, which is exactly the way you do that. And I guess you also like in some in India and so on, you might also be able to support some of the local uh, communities as well to do that. So I'll close my window here. One second. Please. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> there you go. Shut up. Shut up. The <laughs> we couldn't hear anything. Maybe it was the little birds or something like that. It's actually fine. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, so I love how you're pushing the value up. So I think that's really on the sourcing aspect. And what's interesting, you showed us as well the end results, so T-shirts, for example. So I'm also wondering, you know, this part of it, and you're working with some really cool and great, well-established brand like Adidas, H&M, Ikea, I think you told me, and so on. So how do you, see, what do they see in the value, basically, in getting the yarns from you versus the others? And do you feel, going back to the changing the corporate mindset, that you can influence their business practices? Okay, um, so yeah, the brands, um, I gotta tell you, I've learned a lot in the last <laughs> eight to 10 years. and. Um, been very, very humbled by the power, my God, the power that brands have over people is insane. I really never understood the level of power. And, you know, that again, as I mentioned, you know, this sells for circa 30, 30 pounds and that's, you know, 35 cents. <laughs> and, and the reason, and the rest of it is for these brands, huge, huge marketing budgets. So, as much as you'd like to think that you can influence a brand, you don't. You provide them with ideas and you know you work with them. They, however, definitely influence and drive and create the markets and the mindset shifts and the change in people's patterns and the change in people's behavior. And you know, from that perspective, uh, I mean a good example would be um, you know, in the 1990s again, or, or early early 1990s, if you talk to people about polyester, so this by the way is made from 100 percent sustainable, of course, it's one of our products, but you know, if you went and talked to people about polyester, they would go, oh, get away from me, that stuff stinks. You know, I don't wear polyester, I, we wear cotton. 
And then, of course, you had the big, big sports brands who came up and started making polyester really sexy, right, and really good and really nice. And then before you knew it, within, a, within five years, this entire generation of 60 years where polyester was disgusting, suddenly in five years became sexy and everybody wanted to wear polyester for, for clothing, right, in, in, in sports. And now it's, you know, trackies and all of that sort of stuff. But the point is, they then went into this. Um, it started it started off with a couple of really big brands and wanting to, to show that they were sustainable. And it very quickly moved within about a two to three year period between 2017, 18 and 2021. It moved from being, you know, something we want to show we're doing to something that's really inherent within their business models. A lot of them. A lot, a lot of them truly, truly believe it now at the top of the group and the top of the organizations right through to the second generation. How do we reduce our CO2? How do we be more sustainable? You know, why wouldn't you buy this if it's the same quality, same price compared to conventional? Why wouldn't you replace it, right? You know, what stops you from doing it? And so, yeah, you don't influence the brands. They, they influence others and they drive the markets and you work with them to to be able to give them the opportunity to do so, I would say. That's becoming a commercial imperative, basically, for those brands, intimately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes total sense. All right, so I've seen a few questions popping in, so I'm going to just ask you one final one, because um, clearly you've been in, an innovator in this field for quite a while and so on. I was wondering, you know, from your perspective, what do you see as the next innovation in the circular fashion? Whoa. Uh, many. You said <laughs> I can stand it. I can give you an hour and a half to two hour presentation on just that, Sophie. Uh, God, okay, there's so many developments. I think um, I'll focus just for now on just the polyester yarn side. I think um, I think one of the key areas in this sector really is, is, is as an organization, the transparency side of the supply chain and the ability to show and to prove both to the brand and actually eventually the consumer that when you buy a plastic bottle or when you use and get a used plastic bottle, it's been done in a sustainable manner. You know, there's no child labor involved or there's none of, you know, and to track that bottle as it goes the whole way through the process. And then to know that eventually this product that you buy in the sh shop or whatever, it's truly made from 100% sustainable recycle. It's not you know, it's not a gimmick, it's not a marketing, so that when a consumer buys it, so that's one. And then knowing at the end of the use of this product, where does it go? And how does that get then used? And so we have technology to do that as well. So we can actually take a 100% polyester t-shirt today and convert it back into an ester and then go around the circle. So um, I think there are going to be some interesting developments very soon um, on traceability. Um, traceability, both in terms of, as I said, the supply chain, traceability in terms of what happens to the product at the end. Um, can't say too much on that, but that's an area which I, I like and I think is important. And then, of course, moving on from there, what happens to this once, once you enjoyed enjoyed using it. We have to watch this space, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, whenever we can all meet face to face, it would be fantastic, actually, if you can come as well so we can see it, because I just feel all of that. I want to touch it, basically. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, if we were together, yeah. this, this, this is a nice, feely, touchy stuff. Yeah. It's a nice, yeah. nice so we, stuff. Thing. Exactly. So we can do that. So before I pass on to Erika, if you've got, I've seen a few questions, if you've got any more, put them in the chat now. Um, we always finish by asking our guests if they could recommend someone else to come on the Circular Coffee Conversation. So I was just wondering if you've got anyone in mind. So you could get yeah, yeah. Ooh, you, you put me in a bad spot, man. So if I don't mention people now, they'll be really upset with me. Can I mention <laughs> 50 people? <laughs> and send us a long later. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh boy. Okay, how to make me hated by everybody? <laughs> um, okay, I mean, if you want to talk about circular economy, which you just mentioned now, for example, and what's happening there and how the products get you. I mean, there's a, there's a lady by the name of Susan Harris who works for a group called Antisys Group. And, uh, you know, she came from the fashion industry. She's moved into this sort of recycling specter and consulting. And yeah, I, what I enjoy talking to her because she has quite a lot of knowledge about what's going in the market, what's going places. I think she recently also took a non-exec directorship position in a brand. So she's also in there now, not just a consultant, not just picking the market. And yeah, she's pretty knowledgeable about what's going on in the sector of the space. And I always find this very interesting. Um, theory and I, practice. Yeah, and I, I talked about traceability. 
And I think, you know, one of the guys leading on traceability is a guy called Makran uh, Kulkarni. He's based in, in India, and I think they're doing some great stuff in traceability. And, you know, for the next generation, that would be something interesting to talk to as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I turn to Erika just to uh, get some of the questions from the audience answer. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. I'm, I'm really liking this kind of technical design engineering <laughs> chat as well. And I think a few of the, the questions actually that came up were, you'd, I think you've answered some of them actually almost in terms of that you're actually able to already take the, you know, the t-shirts or the, the clothes back and, and, you know, break it back down into a nester and, and make the yarn again. So there was one question around that. And if you, do you offer a return scheme or something around? Okay. So um, well, I suppose it's quite difficult with all your different brands or the, the people that you work with. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, this, this whole sector space of what has really mushroomed up, I'd say really in the last three years, you didn't really see very much about it until, yeah, about three, four years ago. So it's, it's being called now the textile to textile movement of you know, recycled textile to textile. And you kind of have to break it down a little bit because in that sector, that's, I would imagine my head's, kind of breaks it into three functions, really. There's a textile to textile where you have to separate the cotton from, or the spandex or the lycra or whatever from the polyester, okay? And there's that whole separation that the companies who are working on that. Perpetual is not doing that. We are, as our name suggests, focused on PET recycling. So we are, the, in my opinion, the world's experts in PET polyester recycling. So. When people have done the separation, we are working with a couple of companies who've done the separation. And once they've done the separation, they send us the polyester. And then we have the technology to effectively convert the polyester. Okay. Um, so that's what we do. And then in the conversion of the poly of the polyester waste into the ester, you know, that I break up into two areas. Again, there is the waste that you get out when you do the treatment. So the dirt, the, the, the colors, all of that. As you, as you draw out all the colors, all the bacteria, all the dirt and all of that, that is unfortunately, and I said I don't like to use the word waste, but unfortunately there you do have waste, which you really can't do very much with that dye and that mess and that stuff other than maybe incinerate it cleanly or do something with that. Um, and then, of course, you get the esters. So the answer to your question, Erica, this is very much a development stage. I mean, today we've done it both at pilot and, and moving towards, you know, we've done some trials with some brands who've helped fund it. And we've made, we've made yarn back and we've made T-shirts back and, you know, we've made product back from it. But it's still very much at an infancy stage. I think, you know, the development on that, you've got to remember all these developments take you know, from lab scale to prototype to big plant to cost to bringing the price down, it's a it's a it's a long trajectory. Um, so technology wise, it's there to get it to a level where we can say, "Yay, give us back your T-shirt and here's another one." You know, uh, that's at least another five six years. Uh, I would say five years from our perspective. Yeah, and and on that kind of element there, um, I suppose picking up on that that you mentioned the waste. <laughs> but from that processing, there is an associated environmental impact itself. One thing that's come up with a few that, that we've talked to as well is, is particularly around microplastics, I suppose, and synthetic fibres. You know, yep. you kind of get this two, you know, two perspectives really on, on the use of recycled plastics or plastics anyway yeah. um, within clothing. And I think that's, I suppose, an interesting area that I've probably you, you look at as well um, yeah so yeah. um yeah so again i think it's you know it is it's really 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 good that people have brought this to the attention and it's been brought up so i think um yeah i think there's stu many many studies out there now so i think some of them say like 92 percent i've heard of of the plastics in the ocean is synthetic plastics etc so <clears throat> so let's again let's split the problem into two parts or, or maybe three parts again i like to split problems that's the way my head can deal with stuff so there is microplastics in the ocean they come from various sources. I've seen various charts saying where they come from. I won't go into all of that. You can all look at that. Let's just focus then on the, on the stuff that does come from the polyester. Okay. So on the polyester side, I think, again, one has to separate it and one has to understand when you and I talk about polyester, as in clothing polyester, um, 
there's different types of polyester. Let me see if I have some here. Do I have some? Give me one sec. Here we go. So this is also polyester. This is actually called staple fiber. So this is polyester. This is staple fiber. And this is effectively very short chain, typically three to five centimeter chain polyester. It's also made from plastic bottles are also made from virgin material. It's another marketing bit. A lot of this stuff is polyester that is then used to make, well, you would know it more for like stuffing for cushions or teddy bears or that sort of stuff, right? And that polyester is, um, it can also be used to make clothes. So you normally, you can make various clothes. But for example, if I was to take, um, I'm trying to think, a whole range, I wish we were together, you'd see a whole range of stuff. But like, let's say I took this, okay? This is, and that comes across in the camera. But, you know, that's quite fleecy, you know, that's quite, that's quite <laughs> yeah. soft, it's quite fleecy, it's like a rug almost. So that's polyester, I don't know if it's polyester. If I stick that into my washing machine, you're going to get a ton of stuff coming out of that, just like cotton, right, in your dryer. Loads of stuff's going to come off there. Whereas if I take this t-shirt and stick it in it, you ain't going to see any shedding, really. Barely, barely, barely anything's going to come off this. So um, when going back to that problem, um, one has to really, it, it's all very well to say there's a lot of polyester in the ocean. There is. Uh, my point is a lot of it comes from different types of polyester. Um, the high grade, high quality stuff, again, doesn't shed very much at all. The lower grade, low stuff does. That's one. Two, you, I also always say, you know, it's very well to dam it. And by the way, I dam it as well. And, you know, we should fix the problem at the washing machine side. But another question I also tend to ask is, you know, how are you going to clothe 8 billion people? You can't clothe 8 billion people with cotton. You definitely don't want to clothe 8 billion people with bio, bio yarns or bio products because, you know, that eats up way more land, way more facilities and way more, more destruction of the environment. So unfortunately, lump it or like it or leave it, we are stuck with polyester as a, yeah, I have to be careful with the word cheap, but as a, as a price cost effective method to clothe 8 billion people. And yes, we should try and solve that problem from getting into the ocean, the, the washing machine side or whatever, but you know, more get rid of this sort of stuff really. Yeah, and, and I think that that's a really good point, maybe to, I'm just looking at the, the, the time to, to kind of begin to kind of wrap up this area is, and I really see that you recognize your role in this complex, you know, value chain upstream, downstream um, with the big brands and, and also that, you know, things are often moving in all of these areas and changing as well. Um, and that there's actually quite a lot of opportunity, I suppose, to influence both of those areas. Uh, you mentioned the washing machines and yes, actually, you know, we should be. <laughs> as I'm, I'm an electronics design engineer, but oh, well, okay. so why aren't tech, you know, electronics manufacturers putting in that technology there? Because there's so, you know, so many different things around us as well. So collaboration, openness, and, and working with those that you sell the different types of um, plastic parts to recognise you know, what what they should potentially do to make it better. And I'm and I'm but, sure it'll happen, right? I'm sure it'll happen, Eric. I'm sure you know. Again, this is a problem that has now been brought to the attention, which is great. And, you know, this, this is exactly what people should do. And, you know, just from a perspective of, of, of great business, you know, washing machines 10 years ago never used to talk about less water or less energy, right? Yeah, yeah. No, Faster exactly. spin cycles, make your clothes smell nice, blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. you know, 10, 15 years ago was uses less energy, uses less water. And so I'm sure... I'm sure they're going to be washing machines that come out with, you know, yeah, yeah. better filters, traps more dirt, stops more diability. I mean, you know, yeah. this is, uh, the, I, I do believe in the power of entrepreneurship. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to. I mean, I, yeah, that. I think that is a, a what, where what you see startups or entrepreneurs beginning to solve those problems or come up with solutions. Tracy's just actually mentioned Guppy Friend. I've got something called a Cora Ball that I've been experimenting yeah. with to see yeah. how it works. Yes, I, <laughs> Seems to get I, a lot I, I've got one of those as well. <laughs> and, I see, and, and I've seen retrofitting um, elements also to put in as well. But a really interesting area, because I think as you say, you know, the scale of, of the clothing that we already have on the market that needs to be recycled and all the bottles, as well as, you know, shifting from, from one type of um, material to another can disrupt the system in a different way if you start you know, using jude cops to 
to my own close. Um, but with uh, I'd better kind of um, close up now. It's been really amazing, uh, Vivek. And actually, I think probably Sophie agrees that it would be brilliant to have you back for one, potentially an in-person session once we get our heads together, um, because it would be lovely to, you know, this is a really touchy-feely um, <laughs> type of subject sure. um, we need, as we well need, to, we need to, to dive into. Together as well. <laughs> yeah, and I know we've had quite a few people actually on the chat who are working around yarn and fibres and recycling and things like that. So yeah, really a lot of interest um, in this topic as well as your experiences of working with big brands and businesses as well, which is a whole other topic of navigating those types of um, collaborations as well. But um, yeah, to those who have joined, just to say we're just organising the next session uh, which will be in a couple of weeks time we're just confirming the dates but it should be with Alice McGowan from Earth Living Festival and runs also Alice um, May Yoga um, and the whole theme is around rest regeneration um, as well as looking at experiences around the, the circular economy as well um, before I think so you know I think about taking a little break over summer <laughs> for us all to rest and, and regenerate reflecting all the sessions we have before Athens as well but we will be updating everyone uh, on that if you've signed up and online as well uh, but yeah, thank you again Vivek it's been very have a wonderful inspiring. summer everybody enjoy <laughs> summer you Take too bye-bye